Hi everyone, I'm Mona Chan with Mebel Transforming Furniture. This webinar is produced by Mebel Transforming Furniture, which supports change makers across the furniture industry in transitioning to a sustainable and circular future. We'd like to thank our co-sponsors, the Sustainable Furnishings Council, IIDA New York Sustainability Circle, and the New York School of Interior Design. This event is presented as part of NYC by Design's festival starting today through May 25th. Check out the amazing calendar online. All our links are in the chat. So why are we here today? The climate is in crisis. The past nine years have been the warmest years since modern record keeping began in 1880. And as it hits ever closer to home for all of us, people of color and our world's most vulnerable communities are experiencing the impacts of climate change most deeply. We believe that we can each be part of the solution and that it is time for every industry, including the furniture sector, to step up on climate. But where to start can seem overwhelming. We're here today to dive into that, to begin to build a bridge from those big abstract concepts to our day-to-day -day and our work. To be honest, I only recently thought about the carbon footprint of the stool I'm sitting on right now, or my sofa in the next room. And even while my work is focused on sustainability in the furniture industry, I've had to dig deep to truly understand the, the carbon and climate impact of furniture. That's why I'm thrilled um, in a minute to introduce you to our two guests, two Lucy's, who will be sharing their expertise. Our goals for today are all about building understanding of furniture's carbon footprint. What exactly does carbon footprint mean and why it matters? How um, can we break down and measure the carbon footprint of a piece of furniture and why it's important? And how we each can use this information to take action, to act more sustainably, go further circular and ultimately combat climate change. We wanted to do this important and complex topic justice by offering an extended webinar. When you registered, you likely noted that this is a 90 minute webinar. I'll be interviewing our guests in the first 60 minutes. And we've added an optional 30 minutes at the end to allow for more questions and virtual interaction. So please stay on for the full 90 minutes if you're able. But no worries if you're not. We will be sharing a video, slides, chat, Q&A logs, and a list of resources and links after the webinar. Um, so for many on the webinar today, we're covering new ground. But fasten your seatbelt, and hopefully we'll leave today with a feeling that we can take steps forward on this journey together to learn about and take action on the climate via multiple avenues in the furniture sector. I have two quick logistical announcements to start with. Please put your questions in the Q&A box and not the chat box as they come up. Um, we won't address questions until the end, but feel free to share them as they pop up. And for those needing CEU credit, the information is in the chat. I'd like to welcome our two guests today. Uh, Lucy Arndt, who is the head of sustainability at Dodds and Shoot, a design led procurement company dedicated to sourcing the most sustainable furniture and lighting. She has over a decade of experience in addressing sustainability and climate risks and opportunities within the private sector. I have a fun fact about Lucy A. She just had a baby three weeks ago. <laughs> And yeah, while wow, she's here with us today, that's so inspiring um, that as a as a mama, I can say that this conversation is dedicated to the new generation. Um, Lucy Crane, she is the sustainability manager at Modus Furniture. 
She has led the company to become one of Britain's most progressive furniture manufacturers. And her unrelenting pursuit of a more sustainable way forward has resulted in a in pioneering work in the world of furniture. And a fun fact about Lucy C is that she wrote one of my favorite furniture company sustainability reports. It's bold and beautiful and accessible. And it includes a fantastic summary of Kate Rayworth's donut economics framework for respecting planetary boundaries and social justice. Uh, you can check it out on their website. Um, I'll be referring to the two Lucy's today um, by Lucy A and Lucy C. Um, so thanks for joining us. Hi. Um, <laughs> So I'm going to start with Lucy A and some basics. Uh, a basic point. Can you give us um, a simple explanation of climate change and global carbon dioxide levels? Yes, um, I can try. <laughs> um, so I think this graph is a is a really good visual to show kind of what's been happening um, over the past 2000 years. So what this is showing is the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And I think it's really clear that the levels were really stable um, at about 280 parts per million up until about the Industrial Revolution, um, when humans started burning things like coal. Um, and this level of CO2 uh, dramatically shot up. Um, you know, so why is this important? Well, it's important because this excess carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has caused global temperatures to rise, and this is triggering climate change. So we see this in erratic weather patterns around the world. This might be, you know, tons of rain causing flooding, droughts causing fires, but we're also seeing it um, in rising sea levels from, you know, our various ice cap stores um, melting around the world. Thanks. And so we hear the terms net zero and carbon footprint a lot now. Uh, can you tell us what each of these terms mean? Sure. Um, so I think it's probably important to start out by saying that, you know, we talk about CO2 or carbon dioxide um, and that, that's kind of the, the word that we use all the time, but it's only one of the greenhouse gases um, that is causing climate change. Other ones you might have heard of are methane, but you know, CO2, carbon dioxide is what we use to talk about um, this. Um, and it's really the primary greenhouse gas um, that, it's, that is emitted through human activities, mainly burning of fuel. Um, but net zero is um, the concept that, you know, I guess scientists have worked out what do we need to do in order to avoid the most um, dangerous impacts of climate change. Um, and what this works out at is that we need to reach um, this concept of net zero by 2050 as a world. So what that means is it's basically a like a mathematical um, calculation, the amount of carbon um, that goes into um, the atmosphere needs to be removed from the atmosphere at the end of the day, so the sum is zero. Um, so you know how do we actually achieve that? It, it really relies heavily on dramatically reducing over time the amount of emissions that we are putting into the atmosphere. Um, but then this is paired with ways to actually remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere um, that, you know, from activities that we just cannot avoid. We cannot, um, you know, create new technology quick enough to kind of address this problem. Um, so, you know, there are various ways we can remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, whether that's through nature, with trees or other technology. But yeah, essentially, it's this balancing out to reach net zero carbon. Um, yeah, and, and while this, this concept of net zero is really a global goal, I think what's really important to mention is that, um, you know, many countries have committed to it, but now many businesses are starting to commit to it as it kind of trickles down, um, you know, through economies and societies. Great. Um, and carbon footprint, tell us a little bit about like, uh, can you give us a brief definition of that. Sure, yeah, so carbon footprint um, really essentially is 
I guess the total amount of carbon um, or greenhouse gases that are generated by various actions. So that, you know, our lifestyles, that might be um, your daily commute, the food that you eat, the clothes that you buy, where you fly to, um, all of that. It's uh, the carbon that's generated in the way that products are made, shipped around the world, how they're used, how they're thrown away, or by entire industries or entire countries. Um, so all of these have carbon footprints that can be calculated. And the larger your footprint is, you know, the bigger impact that you or your business or these products will be having on the climate. Um, so this is really important to understand, um, to know for, you know, your business or your products so that you can really identify where your impacts are coming from um, in order to be able to, you know, work towards actually reducing them. That's that's great. Um, that's really helpful to start. Let's let's move to translating this to furniture. So typically, businesses targeting a net zero goal are looking at a ninety to ninety five percent reduction in carbon emissions, as you said, by or before twenty fifty. So that means really really serious cuts. Um, so Lucy C. If we're going to make those significant cuts in the furniture sector, the first thing we need to find out is where all its carbon is coming from. What information do we need to get started in calculating the carbon footprint of a piece of furniture? Um, you need to start with the materials that go into a product. So the first thing that you need to know is which materials and um, what proportion of, of, of those materials um, goes into the product. So you need to know the material breakdown by weight, and you need to know the source of those materials. So where have they come from and how far have they traveled? Um, but the, the really key thing is here is, is how those materials have been produced because different materials have different embodied carbon. Um, and um, this is something that as a manufacturer, we've worked really hard on and manufacturers should be able to tell you what goes into a piece of furniture in, in, a, in a breakdown like that. Um, and then here you can see this kind of life cycle of a piece of furniture. Yeah. So, yep. Uh, your so um we'll, we can go into the carbon calculations for the that chair the balance lounge chair and i i just wanted to start actually with a, another couple of definitions um before we dive into the data what what does embodied carbon mean you just you just mentioned embodied carbon is it the same as a carbon footprint it's very similar um Embodied carbon is all the sum total of all the greenhouse gases that have been released in the production of a material or a product. Um, carbon footprint would um, also include the um, the in the the use phase, if you like. So with a building, when a building is constructed, the embodied carbon is in the construction and it's that's that's the embodied carbon and then the carbon footprint would be also include the in-use phase where you have all the um power that's needed to um provide energy for for that building so you'd have all the electricity and the gas and that would be the carbon footprint so here we're really talking about embodied carbon because the use phase of a piece of furniture generally doesn't um, add much so it's the cumulative amount of carbon that has been released in order to produce the piece of furniture. That's right. Yes, it is the upfront carbon. By the time you get that piece of furniture, a lot of greenhouse gases have already been released. Mm -hmm. OK, and um, just on the top here, we, and we can go into the numbers and the detail, but um, what is the E? Sometimes we see the E in CO2E. Um, can you explain what that, that E is? Sure. Um, Lucy's already mentioned that um, we talk about carbon, but there are um, several major greenhouse gases. 
and they vary in their impact. So um, nitrous oxide is 298 times more damaging um, gram for gram than carbon dioxide. So one uh, kilo of nitrous oxide would be equivalently damaging to 298 kilos of carbon dioxide. And with methane, um, which Lucy mentioned, that's 28 times more damaging. So one kilo of methane would equal around the same impact um, as um, 28 kilos of carbon dioxide. So when we uh, talk about a carbon footprint, really we've standardized the greenhouse gases into um, carbon dioxide. So that E stands for equivalent and it means carbon dioxide or equivalent greenhouse gases because sometimes you'll have a process that doesn't release much carbon dioxide but it might release a lot of uh, a different greenhouse gas okay that's that's helpful so it's a, a way to standardize um, so that we're all talking about co2 e in, in measurements Okay, that's great. Um, helpful. So uh, this is a carbon footprint of Modus's balance lounge chair. And um, I think it's highlighting what you said before about materials, Lucy, see, um, that the, the numbers for the materials are so high. So, and I see that the first and second highest contributors to the chair's carbon impact are materials and fabric. That's almost 80%. Can you walk us through these, these larger categories um, and how we can reduce that embodied carbon? Sure. Um, so this is a molded foam chair. Uh, it's a steel frame and then um, uh, molded foam over the frame. And um, being a uh, petro-based a material, the polyurethane foam in that molded foam is quite um, carbon intensive. So quite a lot of the um, embodied carbon in that chair is in the polyurethane foam. Um, then the, although the image is of a leather chair, this um, life cycle assessment has been modeled uh, using a fabric chair. Um, a fabric cover and um, a large proportion of the embodied carbon is in the fabric. And that's because um, fabric manufacture is quite um, an energy intensive process. And um, you've, you've got a lot of steps from the production of the um, basic fibers right through the weave, the spinning, the weaving, the dyeing, and the various different finishing processes. So fabric does have quite a big impact as well. Um, so we'll be talking a little bit more about how we lower the impact, but you're, um, you're saying that there are certain types of fabric also that may have a lower impact? Yes. Um, at the moment, um, there is not much information out there. So we have to model uh, fabric um, carbon footprints uh, through our software. Um, but what we found is that recycled fibers are lower in impact, that wool is um, higher in impact than you may think. And that is, I, I believe tied up with the methane um, that's produced during um, wool production and renewable fibers, um, uh, plant-based fibers are, you know, not surprisingly much lower in carbon. So um, there are um, various different textiles out there that have lower impacts and they are based around um, the renewable content and the more simple uh, processes. So if you have an undyed fabric, that's taking out one step that you usually see in the production of textiles. Um, but as I say, we definitely need to see more information um, in that sector. Yeah. 
Um, so you have um, materials, finish, fabric, manufacturing, packaging, transport, use phase, disposal. What? Tell me about the disposal as a carbon contributor. What does what does this measure? So when you um, create a life cycle assessment, which this is part of, um, the disposal phase involves various different aspects. You have the um, transport of the goods at end of life back to, um, so a lot of manufacturers offer a take back systems, but you have to count account for the um, emissions associated with transport back to the manufacturer. Um, and then, or um, if they don't, uh, transport to the waste processing facility. And then you would have um, the emissions associated with the sorting and potentially the recycling of various different components. And eventually you'd have the parts that can't be recycled that need to be um, disposed of ultimately through incineration or landfill and the carbon emissions associated with that. So you do get a significant buildup in the disposal phase. And is there, uh, is the repair a way to lower that impact or other ways to think about the disposal phase? Um, so if, if you offer a product that has um, a carbon footprint of say 100 kilos of um, carbon dioxide and equivalent greenhouse gases like this, um, you can extend the life of that product by offering replacement parts. And in the case of this chair, we offer, um, um, you can have a new cover. So you're going to extend the life of the chair quite considerably. And in our, um, because we sell to the contract market, you often get a, um, an interior refurbishment quite regularly. That's, that's a, almost a cyclical process. So every five to 10 years, you get this um, cycle of refurbishment. So you could um, avoid a lot of the um, impacts by offering replacement covers as opposed to the whole chair. The carbon, the upfront carbon, the embodied carbon in the chair is going to be the same but it's going to last over multiple cycles. So you're going to make a saving in the future, if you like, rather than um, a bit like buying an electric car. You know, the 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 carbon, the upfront carbon is there, but you're going to make a saving in time. Um, that's great. Okay. And so one thing we talked about uh, regarding the measurements is that this is a uh, cradle to grave and we've we hear about cradle to gate and cradle to grave measurements can you explain what these mean and why it's significant sure um there's a very set um number of uh stages in a um in a product's life when you do a life cycle assessment and you start with the extraction and production of raw materials and then so that in this, in this slide, that would cover the materials, the finish, and the fabric. Um, and then you have the um, transport of those materials to the factory gate, which would be covered in the materials, finish, and fabric. Then you have the um, emissions associated with the manufacturing of that product and the emissions associated with the packaging materials. And then the product is packed and ready to go at the factory gate, and that's cradle to gate. And a lot of um, carbon footprints, that's what they cover. And it's important to know that that's the scope of the system boundary, it ends there. Um, and in the case of this table, you can see that that's 10.24 kilograms. Um, and when you keep going through the next stages of a product's um, lifespan, you've got the transport from the factory to site, um, which can be, um, you know, very, very short distance, or if you're shipping overseas, it could be quite significant. Um, you have the installation phase where the packaging materials need to be disposed of. You have the use phase, which um, generally 
tends to have no emissions associated with it. Although if you were offering um, spare parts, replacement, refurbishment, you would have some um, emissions associated with, uh, with that. And then you have the disposal phase at end of life, which we've talked about. So um, particularly in a product that is high in um, renewable materials, you will see a significant uh, difference between a cradle to gate um, embodied carbon versus cradle to grave. And here you can see uh, it's almost it's almost 100% um, more cradle to grave than cradle to gate. So it, it is helpful as we start to measure to, to look at the whole life cycle cradle to grave um, for sure, because you see it's almost double. Um, okay, now the first time someone told me um, about the um, number of grams of sugar in a can of Coke, uh, they said it's 39 grams and I gasped and I thought, wow, I guess I should be alarmed, but the number was meaningless to me without co context. Um, so should I have gasped when I saw your lounge chair was 100 uh, kilograms of embodied carbon? Like, how can I make sense of these numbers? Can you scale it to something that is understandable? to lay people like me um so here i've used some um average cradle to gate um figures that um are um readily available for people to see that have been produced by fira and you can see the task chair is around the same as a hundred mile drive in um a fairly inefficient car, I'd say 33 miles to the gallon. Um, a dining chair, this is my favorite one, um, of, at 27 kilograms is the same as 10 quite small cheeseburgers. So um, uh, th that I think was really mind blowing. And then the lounge chair is around the same as 10 hours of talking on your um, cell phone. <laughs> on your mobile. So um, the chair that I showed you, obviously that's a cradle to grave um, assessment. So that will come up a little heavier than these, um, but that's around the same as um, one return flight from New York to Boston. So um, it is, you know, it definitely adds up. Okay, that is helpful. And I will try to reduce the number of cheeseburgers I eat in the year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so you've, you've mentioned that doing these detailed carbon and life cycle analyses yielded some surprises. Can you tell us about a couple of those? Examples? Sure. So I've given an example, I think of the Clara chair, yeah. Um, so this chair was designed to enable um, multiple um, life cycles because the um, it's constructed with a tubular metal frame and then four loose cushions. Each one can come out and um, it has a removable cushion cover. So you could just replace the, the covers or replace a cushion and a cover. Um, but when we modeled it, um, we found that it was really fairly high in um, embodied carbon. And when we looked into it, that was, again, that was because of the polyurethane foam. So um, this started a thought process um, in, the, in the design team, which uh, I'll, I'll explain a bit more about um, with one of the slides in a minute. So then you... Um... You talked about the PLC chair, the wood versus the Clara chair. Um, and we can go to that next slide. Yeah, so these are both lounge chairs. They're both quite small. Um, they obviously they look 
quite different, but they are ultimately fulfilling a similar purpose. Um, and the Clara chair is significantly higher in embodied carbon. And that's because the PLC chair is predominantly um, made from renewable materials. It's solid oak and uh, oak veneer on pressed plywood. There's not much fabric. Um, the image shows an upholstered seat, but this is actually modeled on an upholstered seat and bag. So there's some foam and some fabric, but significantly less than there is in the Clara chair. Um, but that is because the Clara chair, I had to write this down, only contains 13.45% renewable materials, whereas the PLC lounge chair is 99.24% renewable materials. And, um, and that's why you get this really big difference between the two. Right, so that's where you could really see the difference in the material choice. Um, that's uh, quite a big difference in the uh, carbon in the materials there between the Clara and the PLC. Um, and then, uh, so it's so helpful to have real data to question and reinforce or make better decisions. And you also had a great example of how calculating the carbon footprint of one of your products, so Clara Chair, led to an interesting business decision. Can you tell us about that? Sure. Um, so we have a collection um, by Pearson Lloyd called um, Edge, and we were developing a um, seating system that was kind of an add-on to this um, collection. And originally, we were going to offer a, um, a polyurethane foam and polyester fiber version, which is how most sofas are constructed. And we thought about also offering um, a version that was made just using natural fibers. So we um, we looked at coconut fiber and wool um, in to replace the polyurethane foam and polyester fiber. And when we modeled them, the difference was so huge. Um, and you can see from that bar chart that um, the big difference is in the first stage, the A1 stage, which is the extraction and production of raw materials. Um, and as you look through the whole um, life cycle of, um, this is modeled on a three seat sofa, um, there's not a huge difference, um, but in that first stage, the materials are so um, far apart that you end up with um, uh, the option of having a coconut fiber um, version or a polyurethane foam version that's almost double. So um, we scrapped the idea of making a polyurethane foam version and just offer the um, coconut fiber version. And um, that's, that's, that's really starting to um, create a lot of interest um, now. That's great. And you said it has al already won two design awards awards in the UK? It has. It's, um, it's won the Design Guild mark. It's won a sustainable design collective. It was a runner-up in, in, in a um, product category there. And it's, um, it's um, been nominated for another um, a mixology award as well. So fingers crossed. <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, yes, good luck with that. Um, but it is, it's fantastic to hear how uh, these, this data really helped in, in making um, better choices and better decisions as a, as a business also um, to go from two versions to doing it only in the coconut fiber. Um, so We've shared some examples of the carbon footprint calculations for pieces of furniture and how they break down and how to make meaning of them, um, things to pay attention to and comparisons. But let's let's turn to some popular tools out there um, and other ways that we can further apply these concepts. So turning back to you, 
Lucy A. You've worked with hundreds of manufacturers. Tell us a bit about how some furniture manufacturers are measuring their carbon um, and what are some tools, common tools out there. Um, and just as a reminder to everybody on the webinar, um, we, we will be sharing resource links after this webinar. So um, we won't share it now um, and distract you, but um, you'll get all these links after. Um, great. Yeah, I'm really happy to talk about this. So just as a reminder um, about us and why we've worked with hundreds of manufacturers. Um, so Dodson Shoot is a furniture dealer or um, yeah, procurement partner. And so we represent various um, manufacturers. So what I'm doing here is I'm just going to talk through a few examples um, of brands that we work with who are using different tools to calculate their footprint. Um, I think it just shows that there's a lot of different um, options out there and people are doing things in lots of different ways. That has pros and cons. I think there's not a lot of standardization across the market at the moment, um, but it does mean there's a lot of, you know, different options out there for people to be using. Um, and of course, Modus, you know, Lucy C has just talked about the various ways that they're doing things, which I think is a super high standard. So, um, you know, I'm not going to talk about them, but I would definitely say they're they're right up at the top there. Um, so I first company I'm going to talk about is um, Benchmark Furniture. So they're based in the UK and um, they use what's called an EPD or an environmental product declaration um, for assessing their life cycle, um, for doing their life cycle analysis and assessing the impacts of some of their products. Um, so yeah, an, an EPD kind of says it in the title, but it's it's broader than just carbon and a climate impact. It um, is, you know, has a kind of a wider look um, to, you know, other environmental impacts. So some of the things that it looks at are things like um, fresh water use, or use of um, resources or looking at um, various energy sources. So you can see, it, I know this is a very, very detailed table, so it's just to show that it's an extremely detailed assessment that's done. Um, but you can see on the left-hand side, um, GWP, for example, stands for Global Warming Potential, and that's kind of um, more just the carbon footprint side of things, but the other um, lines below look at, uh, you know, various different aspects. So I would say, and I think it's widely recognized that an EPD is really the most accurate um, assessment that is, is available. It sometimes or often comes along with a third party external um, verification, um, which means that somebody outside of your business is, you know, really looking at the calculations that you're doing to make sure that they're accurate. Um, but the, you know, what I would say is that it is really probably the most expensive and detailed option. Um, you know, it takes a lot of time, it can take a lot of money for that third party assessment or for having, you know, a real uh, expert crunch this data because not every company maybe has somebody in internal to do this um, on your team. Um, you know, but I would say that um, EPDs are out of all the kind of uh, options that are out there, the ones that are recognized um, by various building certifications. So um, you can gain, like furniture can help um, support, uh, you know, interior designers, architects, whatever, to gain points in various um, building certifications such as BRIAM or LEED. Um, so that's a kind of plus side <laughs> um, for doing any, for choosing to do an APD. So yeah, that's a little bit about that one. Um, and then the next case today I want to talk through is TAC. So they are um, based in Denmark and they are using um, a tool called Malbar for their life cycle assessment. Um, this really has three different levels that a manufacturer can select in terms of how they want to do their calculations. Um, so they're listed here on the screen, but um, just to summarize what they are looking at. So level one um, is based on various weights of components that go into a product. Um, and then in um, kind of uh, it paired with that, it's also using data from a large global environmental database. 
Um, so that's for aspects such as waste or packaging. It can also include energy and materials. Um, so what that means is the manufacturer is supplying some data, but then also using some benchmark data. So level two is then kind of an improved screening where the manufacturer is actually providing waste and shipping data. And then again, level three, the manufacturer is um, providing even more data about the production process. Um, so what, what we're really seeing is we're seeing quite a few of our um, European-based manufacturers starting to use this as the life cycle assessment that they are using, the tool that they've selected. Um, but as you can see, it uses quite a lot of benchmark data, which in many cases is, you know, essential in order to get any kind of calculation done. Um, but it does mean that it's often not as sort of detailed or accurate as an EPT. Um, and in that, and because of that, it is not currently accepted by these various building certifications. I think they're working towards getting some recognition, but currently um, that is a con of using this type of tool. But um, as you can see, I think what is really valuable about getting this data is, um, as Lucy C was talking about, not only making business decisions about how to make it various adjustments with products that um, are being designed and produced, but also it's a really great communication tool. So as you can see on the screen, um, I think TACT Asmodis does a really great job of um, kind of explaining and showing um, this journey, you know, the various stages in the life cycle of a product. Um, and then, you know, what that means at the end of the day. So I think it's a really good tool for communicating with stakeholders as well as making internal business decisions. Um, and then the final example that I wanted to talk through is Emico. So they are based in Pennsylvania and they use a tool called the 2030 calculator. So I'd say that this is, so the, just to say, um, Malbar is quite specific for furniture. Um, which is great because it has a lot of specific furniture data. Um, the 2030 calculator um, is available for lots of different products. So it's kind of a, a next step down in terms of, you know, more general data, I guess you could say in some cases. But the great thing about it is that it's um, a free to use online tool. So it's really accessible to anybody. It's a great starting point to be able to jump in and um, start to analyze the impacts of your products. Um, so how this one works is that it uses emission factors um, for each of the product parts, for materials, for packaging, transport, energy, um, all of that. Um, but I think, yes, yeah, I was saying what's great about this is that um, because it's a more simplified online tool, Amico has been able to um, use this for, I think, all of their products or nearly all of their products, which is pretty unusual. Most, I think when you're doing EPDs or even Malbar, because there's a cost associated with it, um, manufacturers are often choosing a couple of products, which is fine. That's the way you got to start somewhere, right? But Emico has been able to do this kind of across the board, um, which really provides a, a kind of an, you know, a whole view of, of their, their lines and, and, um, what their what various you know changes in their products uh, look like in terms of carbon. Um, one interesting sort of example, just to to give a bit of life to this, um, is that Emico is continuously working on the material used in um, their uh, one 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 navy chair, um, which was originally made out of one hundred and eleven um, recycled plastic bottles. But what they were doing is that as they changed the formula, um, they input these values, different values into this calculator. And they were able to determine if, you know, the change in the formula shifted what was going on with the carbon footprint. Um, and as a result of this, you know, they were able to shift the ratio of material in this chair. So they were increasing the amount of recycled plastic and reducing the amount of um, glass fiber. So what happened at the end of the day is that it was a lighter chair with a higher amount of recycled content. Um, this reduced the carbon footprint in you know, a few different ways, both in terms of transport, because it was less energy to ship it, um, but also in terms of the material, because there was uh, less use of you know, virgin materials at the end of the day. Um, so I think this is you know, a great example, just showing again how having real data or, you know, as much data as you possibly can about tweaks in, in your production and your design, um, about that, how that can, you know, at the end of the day, have an impact um, on the climate and, um, 
you know, make sure that you're, you're kind of the, the changes that you're making over time are actually doing what you want them to be doing, um, which is, yeah, reducing your impact. So yeah, those, those, those are three examples. Yeah. And that, uh, that's great to hear that example. It came up in one, in the Q and A of how you can, uh, measure the materials before you you even get started. Um, so, um, you also have a good data sample of um, companies, Lucy, eh? <laughs> in order um, to source responsible products, you evaluate furniture manufacturers through a sustainability survey. Uh, mm -hmm. How do you think manufacturers can use your survey as a benchmark tool? Yes, so we um, launched our um, sustainability survey in 2018. And since then, we've had um, more than 175 uh, responses from manufacturers. A lot of those are in Europe, um, but also in the US and around the world. So we are, as you said, we're starting to have this kind of pool of data about what different manufacturers are doing. Um, so we see our suppliers using um, both the survey itself and the questions, but also the results of the survey in a few different ways. Um, so, you know, we're thrilled to see that some of the people and the brands that we're working with have used this questionnaire as kind of a best practice guide. So we've put this together from both our experience, but also so, you know, we're kind of, I guess, the middleman between the end client and the manufacturers. And so we've put the survey together from all of the various questions we are getting from, from our clients. So they might be architects or interior designers or developers or, and you know, end clients. And so we've consolidated this into this questionnaire. Um, so our, you know, manufacturers that we work with are using this as a, as a way to sort of focus in on the sustainability actions that they want to take over time um, and the ways that they can improve year on year. And that's great for us to see that it's a useful tool for, for this improvement. Um, I think a, a good example of this is that um, we actually see a lot of, so it, there are sort of five key sections. One of them is governance. And um, that's all around sort of transparency, um, making sure sustainability is strategically in, in embedded into how a company is functioning. Um, so we've seen a lot of our suppliers um, start to take action on, on this area. So perhaps producing a sustainability report or, or releasing and committing to sustainability targets or, you know, having a mission statement, um, which we believe is really important to um yeah making sure that sustainability is more strategic and it is a more sort of um not just random acts that's happening over time but a really core cool part of what a company is doing and working on um yeah it, in the future so we've seen that as a as a way that the the, the actual questions themselves are being used by our suppliers um, but we've also seen that our manufacturers um, are using the survey and the results as kind of a benchmarking tool so um to kind of to assess where they are in terms of their competitors or you know other other companies out there um to be honest this is one of the reasons that we launched the survey you know everybody talks about sustainability their climate actions what they're doing in so many different ways um but we really wanted to try to find a way to compare apples to apples so that we could help our clients um in the best way that we could and also make the decisions that we want to make to be working with the best brands. So, you know, that's really interesting to be able to see various companies being like, oh, you know, we thought we performed really well in, you know, whatever it is, end of life. But actually, we can see that there are lots of companies that are doing some really innovative stuff. Um, and, you know, that's a that's a sort of uh, uh, examples to kind of guide the way and, <laughs> you know, aim towards. So, yeah, we're, we're really we're really proud that um, it's being used in a variety of ways. I think I think, um, yeah, just to talk really briefly about what's on the screen, if that's okay. Um, you know, I think that what we did over time was we started to add more questions on climate change because of the increased interest we were having from our clients. Um, so from 2018 to now, we've added some more questions. Um, and I think that, um, you know, what we've seen is that there are some, we're starting to see some key trends coming out of the data, which is, is valuable for us, but also hopefully for our clients and for the wider industry. 
Um, but these results that we're seeing, we are seeing is being used really in two key ways. So one is, as I was kind of saying, to provide some guidance and insight for the industry and for brands to take action. So whether that's, um, you know, I get calls all the time from suppliers that we work with saying, what is the most, you know, what if I if I was going to um, certify a product or, you know, a collection, which certification should I, you know, should I go for? And I can say with some confidence, well, you know, we've collected data from 175 brands. I can say that the most commonly used certification is X. <laughs> um, or, you know, we see that in, you know, Scandinavian countries, this is really popular. Um, and so I think that that's really valuable for, for suppliers. Um, but then the other way that this data is being used is, of course, by our clients. So one of the key reasons we're collecting this information is we want to be able to meet our clients' needs in terms of their specific sustainability criteria. Um, so we're helping them to make selections on furniture that, you know, is based on whatever they're looking for. Um, and we can do this because of the data that we've gathered. Right. And um that you're seeing in the data that it is um you have companies that are really interested in uh these issues around climate that we're talking about today and materials um and energy and emissions um can you just talk a couple of minutes about what materiality is Yes, I love the concept of materiality because I think um, as we're talking about today, you know, we all, Lucy and I both keep coming back to data. Um, and I think that's really the, the starting point for um, all, all of this, you know, making an initial assessment and taking action. Um, as we say in sustainability all the time, um, you can't manage what you don't uh, measure. So, you know, you've got to start with measurement. And materiality is really the concept of understanding what the most significant impact um, is. So what is the most material uh, you know, source of emissions, for example, in producing, using, and disposing of a piece of furniture? Um, so you can, so that's in terms of actual production of furniture, but you can also use the materiality concept in terms of a, a wider project. So if you're, you know, if you're um, installing a hotel, you know, what is the what are the biggest impacts that that um, installation is having? And those are the aspects you really should be focusing on first. You know, worrying about the the biggest impacts, and not not necessarily worrying so much about the the, you know, five percent or whatever percent um, that isn't the biggest. If you need somewhere to start, start with what's material. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, actually, uh, you mentioned materials. Um, let me just uh, jump to Lucy C um, and talk a little bit more about ways to lower furniture's carbon footprint. We've talked about materials um, already a bit, but um, let's get specific about steps we could take. So, um avoiding the use of virgin materials um, generally will reduce the impact of a piece of furniture. So if you can use waste materials, um, that uh, is really, really popular um, uh, in, in Europe now as the concept of circular economy is really growing. So we're seeing that a lot. So waste materials um, uh, offering um, replacement parts so that your product can see multiple life cycles rather than just one. It can keep going over um, a, a series of lives. Um, when I talked about the PLC chair and the V-desk um, and how using renewable materials really brings down the embodied carbon in a product, that's something to really look out for. Um, which um, throws up a potential for um, deforestation. So make sure that you are buying sustainably harvested materials because otherwise the carbon impact is going to be quite big if there's a lot of associated um, deforestation with the use of timber. 
Um, fabric, as I explained, tends to be quite a big um, factor in, um, in upholstered pieces. So uh, choosing fabrics that are lower in impact, such as um, um, hemp, linen, organic cotton, um, uh, that tends to be um, less um, carbon intensive than um, um, uh, plastic based fibers. Um, also look for furniture that uses fabrics in a resourceful way. So we've discovered that modular seating where the fabric covers a whole piece and then another piece butted up against it and then the fabric goes over as opposed to one seat. So look for a resourceful use of materials in general, but also textiles. Um, the red chair that I've got there, um, that was a real breakthrough for us because um, in fact, I'm sitting on one of them now. And usually um, you would put glue on that uh, molded foam and the cover would sit really tightly against the foam. Um, and then at end of life, you have a fabric cover glued to your um, foam seat. So um, we engineered out the glue so you can remove that cover. So at, um, when that looks tatty, you can remove the cover and buy a new cover and um, save the most significant um, um, carbon, um, the, the most, the, the part of the chair that has the most significant amount of carbon, which is the, the foam. Um, then because of the disposal uh, phase, you need to look for products that will uh, break apart into individual mono materials um, so that you can um, recycle them um, or, 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 or offer replacement parts as well. And I talked a lot about um, foam and um, uh, um, all plastics actually being really quite uh, carbon intensive. So I've, I have a picture there of a chair that looks like a molded foam chair, but actually that's a pressed ply frame with some foam over the top. So you're really reducing the amount of foam there. Um, and then always using um, healthier um, finishes that aren't really high in um, petrochemicals. So not solvent based finishes um, will also have some impact. But I think if I were going to pick a couple of things, I'd say look for renewable materials, look for things that have been designed for disassembly um, and try and avoid focusing on um, a lot of manufacturers talk about this is 99% recyclable. And I think this is a bit of a red herring because um, plastic is recyclable but only 9% has ever been recycled. So we need to focus on um, what's going in and on the recycling infrastructure that's readily available to you. Um, so your steel and your aluminium can easily be recycled. Plastics, not so much. Um, although I'm sure that is going to change right where we are right now. It's not so easy. Um, so yeah, I think that gives a sort of, if you don't have the carbon footprint of a product, these are some key kind of things you could look for. That's uh, very helpful. Um, I uh, want to come back with lots of questions about uh, these uh, points you made, um, but I want to transition us into our last half hour. Um, as it's a 90 minute webinar, uh, some people, and the third, last 30 minutes is optional, some people might be dropping off, but um, we will be sending the links to the video slides, resources lists. Um, you will be getting a pop-up uh, feedback form for us, for those that are jumping off now. Uh, when, you, when you jump off, um, you'll get a feedback form, please fill it out. Um, and then we'll just be doing more questions um, now. So we'll just jump into that. Um, so uh, at 
One of the things that we did at Mebel um, in collaboration with the Sustainable Furnishings Council and Soma Studio Milano last year was a circular design glossary for furniture and furnishings. And a lot of questions that have come up are around like how the circular practices, which you've both mentioned, specifically affect the carbon footprint. Um, you've talked a little bit, uh, you've talked a bit about recycled materials. Um, uh, can you can you tell us more about um, how it reduces the the carbon impact using recycled materials or biodegradable natural fiber fabric versus recycling synthetic coverings or um, the carbon footprint of new furniture versus using vintage or thrift furniture? Some of those circular practices. Um, how do you how do you apply the carbon footprint calculations to to that? Lucy or Lucy, any either? <laughs> um, I was going to say that um, when we model in our software, um, and I'm not sure how much of this is readily available, but I think with a bit of research, it it could be found. Um, a Generally, a recycled material um, will um, have a much lower embodied uh, carbon content because it doesn't take as much energy as it does to produce the material in the first instance. And I think aluminium is a really good example, actually. And that's that's presumably that's why um, Emiko's chair is so um, uh, low, relatively speaking, low in embodied carbon. Um, and, and I think that's because the extraction of aluminium from the ground and the extraction of aluminium ore and uh, the creation of that pure aluminium is really um, carbon intensive process. Whereas melting aluminium that has already had that done to it is, um, and I, I don't know the figures, um, but um, I, I know they're in my brain somewhere, but it's pretty <laughs> significant, uh, the difference. So uh, looking for a really high recycled content with something like aluminium is great, but um, some recycling processes do use a lot of energy. And um, it sometimes I think um, it, it, without the data, it's hard to say for sure, um, sometimes, uh, I've been surprised at how um, carbon intensive some recycled materials still are. Yeah, that uh, aluminum um, example is is great. It's super helpful. Um, so, it, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to give um, an answer in terms of vintage or remanufactured. Um, so I think this is a really interesting one because, of course, the embodied carbon essentially, you know, is there. It's happened. The the product was made, you know, whether it was 100 years ago or five years ago. Um, uh, but I would say that vintage or remanufacturing obviously comes along with some carbon footprint because the product still has to be transported. Um, it may have to be refurbished. Um, whether that's you know new fabric or repolishing or whatever, but I think the the stats that I've seen is that um, remanufactured and vintage typically has around eighty percent lower carbon footprint than than a product um, than a new product. So um, you know inherently it has a lower carbon footprint, um, and so we've definitely started to see some of our clients really keen to look at vintage and remanufacturing. Um, coming from a climate perspective. So they're really looking at the carbon footprint of you know, their projects. And so that is why they're looking at vintage, not even from a kind of look and feel perspective, but purely from a climate change perspective, which I think is really, you know, really interesting development. Um, yeah. That's great. Um, we have had a lot of questions in the QA, Q and A and many that were submitted when people registered. So I try to, um, uh, summarize a little bit. Um, we have some questions about standards. Um, what LCA certification programs exist in the furniture industry? 
Um, are there acceptable limits or ranges of um, carbon footprint in different types of furniture? Um, are there any industry standards? I'm happy to speak a little bit to this. Um, I'd say no. You know, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of different actions being taken across the the furniture industry at the moment, and there really isn't standardization, as I kind of mentioned earlier. But I would say that an EPD is kind of the closest to that. You know, it um, does follow or it can follow ISO guidelines, guidelines, um, and it can be externally verified. So I'd say that at the moment, from a carbon perspective, that's kind of the closest that we have. There are, of course, loads of other um, certifications for furniture that's not specific on um, carbon. But I think we're kind of at the beginning of this journey for this industry. I think that this will develop over time. You know, I think we'll be in a really different place um, in five years um, as there's more data available. You know, Lucy was mentioning that you specifically mentioned fabrics. You know, there's just not the data in that sector. Um, so I think there is starting to be, you know, even in the last year or so, we're starting to see so many more manufacturers focus on this. And I think as more and more um, brands do, the more data we'll have, the more resources we'll have, the more software we'll have. Um, so I, I really do think we're kind of at the beginning of the journey, um, which presents opportunities, but also a lot of challenges. Yeah. Um, I was going to say about a life cycle assessment. Um, when people do life cycle assessments, it should be, there are standards. Um, so you can look for um, a life cycle assessment that is to the ISO 14,044 and 14,040 standards. Um, I think that's quite helpful for people to be able to look out for that. And a life cycle assessment to that standard using that methodology um, is what you submit to create an environmental product declaration. So um, the difference being that it's not third party verified. So um, like in our case, we do not have any EPDs yet but we've used exactly the same process that you would use. Um, it just hasn't been third party verified. So I think that's quite a useful standard to look for an LCA that has been produced to the ISO 14,044 and 14,040 standard. And then EPDs should be to the EN 15804 um, 2012 plus A2 2019 standard. <laughs> Um, I think that's right. Um, and that uh, that outlines how an environmental product declaration should be um, should be carried out. Uh, but yeah, I agree, there is a real lack of standardization. And I actually think that in the same way that you get nutritional labeling on food, I do think that um, you we're going to start to see a lot of product passports being created where there's information because we have this amazing bit of technology, which is the QR code. So we can create QR codes that link to web pages that tell someone how to um, deal with their product at end of life. And that's really um, critical. And I think in the same way that you're going to see this kind of um, product passport for end of life, I think you're going to kind of see this kind of um, embodied impacts. And I think actually carbon, um, I do think it should be widened carbon, which I think is where um, Malbar have come in with their product environmental footprint, the PEF, which does show this, um, I think it's 13 environmental impact categories, um, because we do need to look beyond carbon even though we've only really just started to look to look at that. Yeah. Um, interesting. And we've also um, gotten some questions in the chat and comments about the, I wanted to move to materials a little bit. We, we have some comments, some suggestions about alternatives to foam. Um, in the Q and A, and I think in the chat, so we, we will be sharing that. Um, uh, regarding the materials, I think there are some questions about like which is better. Like, is FSC wood a lower carbon impact than non FSF FSC wood, um, or um, leather uh, versus synthetics? Um, 
and you know or the upholstery fabrics that are um, being used, how can they be durable if they are you know, recycled or, or such or bio-based? What is, uh, how can we start to look at uh, these materials and are there resources that exist that can help um, sourcing? So if you start with um, FSC, I think you said FSC timber. Um, so um, a little bit of a complex question because um, a bio-based material contains carbon that it has sequestered in the process of growing. So as part of the carbon cycle, a bio-based, um, any plant is going to contain what we call biogenic carbon. Um, which is different to embodied carbon. So it will contain biogenic carbon and then the embodied carbon will come from the, um, the felling, the processing, the shipping of that product. And I would say um, there are so many factors at play here. Um, if you bought um, sustainably sourced timber um, F with FSC certification from, say, China, and you shipped it all the way to the States, that is quite likely to have a higher embodied carbon than something that's been homegrown, uh, but maybe isn't certified. But in order to protect biodiversity and ensure um, sustainable forest management, you're going to have to choose the FSC certified timber. So sometimes we have to walk this quite complex line um, uh, that is often riddled with ethical dilemmas. Um, and the FSC cert certified timber is a really um, topical, actually, because in Europe, a lot of the um, FSC certified timber was coming from Russia. So that posed a big problem to manufacturers. And we had to think on our feet and quickly find some way of getting um, uh, sustainably um, sourced timber that wasn't from Russia. I'm slightly going off piste here, but um, you know, timber throws up a whole new. Um, so what we did is um, we were already developing, um, uh, trialing and using spruce um, rather than a hardwood um, plywood to make our um, uh, upholstery frames. And we could get the spruce plywood with FSC certification, not from Russia, when um, all manufacturers were um, desperately trying to get um, supply of FSC certified um, wood. Um, uh, and a lot of that was Russian. So we kind of, we changed, but that really came about um, from the, the biodiversity aspect and the um, faster replenishment of a fast growing wood like spruce, as opposed to a very slow growing uh, product, um, like the hardwood plywoods that, that we would normally use. So sorry, that's a very long answer. But um, I think there's so many things at play when it comes to timber. But you've always got to get something that's been sustainably sourced. Um, Lucie, did you have anything to add about um, materials or um, bio-based solutions, maybe? Uh, are you seeing some bio-based solutions for materials? Yeah, so what I was going to say is that I think as a general rule, bio-based or natural materials have a lower impact um, than non-bio-based materials. And this is um, partly because of the end of life phase. So those materials generally tend to be, you know, they can be biodegradable or whatever, and don't need so much processing um, in order to break down that product. So I think that that's a, you know, really good general rule to go by is if you're looking at various inputs or materials for a product, generally natural materials do have a lower footprint than non-natural materials both in the growing and, or, you know, production or whatever, and, and the, the end of life. Sure. 
Sure. And um, Lucy C, you mentioned the um, ethical <laughs> dilemmas. Um, and we've had some questions about uh, communicating the standards and uh, carbon footprints and um, to consumers by companies and also greenwashing, um, how you can avoid greenwashing. Um, how, how can we do this well? Communicate, um, take the steps and communicate well um, and to be sure that we're taking the right steps. It's not greenwashing. Um, that is a really tough question. And I think um, ultimately it comes down to uh, governance, actually. Um, where does sustainability sit within a company? Is it an add-on, as Lucy said? Um, I think people really need to do their homework and to dig a bit. Um, is, the, is it part of an overall strategy? Is it embedded um, high up in the company? Do, is it at board level? Um, who's communicating the, um, the messaging out? Does it stand up to scrutiny? Um, I, I think it is really, really difficult for consumers to be able to tell. I think that um, we need some really tough processes. And um, I know that um, Lucy's process is pretty tough. And there are other um, uh, dealers and specifiers out there who have an, an architect's practices and uh, who ask some really challenging questions that do push us um, to make um, a change. But one thing that I would say that we're seeing a lot more is um, B Corporation. So I think that that is, it, it's definitely not a, okay, rubber stamp, that's fine. Uh, but I think it's helpful. Um, that is a very challenging um, assessment. So if I were going to say, just, you know, if you just want a real quick fix, you just want to find something, maybe look for that. Otherwise, it, it comes down to doing your doing your homework and um, and reading lots. You know, look at what other people are doing. Does this does this stand up to scrutiny? Because ultimately, we are all um, at the mercy of people's honesty um, until there are some regulations to say you cannot say this. And we we are starting to see that. Um, in the EU, I'm sure it will come to the UK. Um, I don't know quite what the situation is in the US, but we're definitely on the verge of some 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 rules, which is great. Okay. Um, on that, uh, just a, a couple of uh, resources. Um, there's the American Sustainable Business Network, uh, one of our partners. They are doing um, a lot of work on lobbying and, and policy, um, green policies. Um, we've mentioned materials. There's uh, the Healthy Parsons Healthy Materials Lab. Well, again, we'll send all these links, but um, that is a useful one for looking at some um, uh, bio-based uh, materials uh, and our partners at uh, Sustainable Furnishings Council as well. We can go to them for uh, lists of certifications and um, some uh, sustainable furniture brands. Um, I'm seeing some... I would some also, sorry, just to jump yeah. in, but I would... Yeah. Um, not to plug us, but I would also say take a look at the Dots and Shoot website. So we the only we only list brands on our website who have performed really highly in our sustainability survey. So just as Lucy was talking about, the survey really tries to 
you know, not look at brands that just have one hero product and go look at how amazing and incredible this one product is, but is really getting to the core of is sustainability strategic? Are there targets? Is it integral to the business? Is it a, you know, something wider that is really part of the mission of that company? So, you know, we, so I just say, if you're looking for, for furniture brands out there, take a look at our website. It's only good stuff on there. So <laughs> that's a good place to start. Um. Great. And we, we have a couple of questions about collaboration. Um, how can different stakeholders collaborate effectively to create meaningful change in the furniture industry? Um, how can we collaborate in the LCA space for furniture so a database can start to be created that can be used across retailers? Um, are you seeing some useful uh, collaborations forming or that have formed? Um, there are already quite a few um, um, furniture um, furniture industry collaborations. So in the UK, we have the Furniture Industry Sustainability Programme, which has manufacturers and it has um, dealers and so on. Uh, there's, um, uh, there's an audit process. But also I'm part of the steering um, committee for the FISP, and that is a very collaborative um, approach. I'm also part of a network of other manufacturers who are who are our competitors, but um, it's got to be a collaborative approach because it, this is um, a, a global issue and um, we, we all need to work together. So I think we're starting to see a lot more collaboration within sectors and between sectors. And um, uh, this is the first time I've done anything um, uh, in the US. And uh, so now we're starting to really see some of these um, uh, threads kind of coming together and people reaching out. Um, and, and that's just fantastic because this is what we really need. Yeah, I would say collaboration is so critical. I mean, um, we need to start, I know that I use the word competitor as well, but we need to start seeing each other as peers that are all working towards the same goal. As you said, it's, you know, it's a problem for everybody. I think that that change and that sort of mind shift is happening, you know, kind of in the dealer space, um, as Lucy's been mentioning, um, lo loads of companies now have had their own kind of survey, but I think that um, there's starting to be work where we're, we're starting to share, you know, that information or that data or those questions so that it's not such a burden for manufacturers to be answering 50 different questionnaires, um, which is that kind of standardization that we need to get to because otherwise it's going to snowball and <laughs> get out of control. We can't solve this alone. So I, you know, as I said before, I think it's kind of at the beginning of that journey but it definitely same with Lucy I'm seeing a lot more of that these days um yes and uh you're getting a lot of questions maybe you will get more questions after <laughs> this webinar um, we will be sharing contact information and we only have a couple of minutes left and there's still so many questions so um we do encourage everyone to stay in touch and this is um you know part of the, our collaboration, getting it started. It's, um, the, I think there's so many questions because we're still only at the beginning of this journey and there's a lot to learn. Um, but at the same time, we need to accelerate action. So um, I think for today, we've gotten hundreds of registrants, um, which to me signifies that we're all ready. And, um, but we only have a couple more minutes on this call. So to wrap up, uh, do you each like, could you share in one minute each one last piece of advice or wisdom with our attendees for taking their next step? Um, I'm happy to jump in. Um, I think we've kind of said this um, before from both of us, but data is so important. Um, I think the more um, 
that manufacturers are generating data, the more that interior designers um, or architects or, or you know, end clients are asking for this data. I think that this is how we're going to really understand where the impacts are coming from. These decisions we've been talking about, how you weigh up different materials. So the more that this this is, um, yeah, sort of supported from everybody across the chain, I think is is really where we where we need to start. <laughs> Yeah, I think um, asking questions, asking questions um, uh, it, it, from your supply chain, that's us asking questions from our supply chain, that's dealers and specifiers asking questions um, from manufacturers, asking the questions and just challenging and being really curious about um, what could be different um, because a small change can lead to a big change and um, uh, just approaching this with a really, really open mind because there are a lot of surprises that you, you might not expect. Yeah, well, thank you, Lucy and Lucy. Um, thanks for sharing your expertise and insightfulness and inspiration. Um, I really appreciate you being here. We will, um, again, send links to the videos and resources. Please uh, fill out your uh, the surveys. Here on the slide, you could see information about the CEU credits. Um, and if your question wasn't addressed yet today, look to our newsletters for further exploration of um, many of these issues. Thanks for taking the time to be with us today. And we look forward to staying in touch. Lots of hearts and uh, clapping. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thanks. everybody. Bye.